Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 774 for July 29th, 2023. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchatz with Programming by Stealth 153. And we're going to talk about my favorite subject, scope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's this is an episode I'm really looking forward to because after I thought this was going to be a three episode arc, but we're finally getting to the end of our journey in terms of learning new stuff. So we are going to come back and do a sort of a a farewell episode where we put everything into context. And what I'm hoping is the farewell episode would be like a quick reference for me Oh, and I'm assuming many others. Good idea. Wrap it in a bow where we know how to get back to all the goodness. This has been a exactly. great series. I'll, I'll actually be sad to see it go. I've I've really enjoyed it. I think I like these smaller bite-sized pieces of, of something, you know, that's not... I mean, JavaScript was a long haul. What was that, two and a half years or something? We were on that. Right. And it was also your very first language. Yeah. So that... that Makes it a longer haul. I, our two more unexpected ones were Git and Bash, and yeah. they've both ended up really good. Oh, yeah, Git. People are st- writing to us now going, hey, I just found this Git series. This is really cool. So, very cool. I use my own show notes a lot. <laughs> I, one of the things I'm really excited about is I have started opening the terminal when I'm coding or when I'm working on the show notes so that I can do my Git stuff right from the command line. And that makes me feel oh, really, really happy. I mean, I still bring out the uh, the big guns with the GUI when things get weird. But I mean, I, I set up a text expander snippet, git com, and that's uh, that's my git commit message with uh, git commit dash am. And, and uh, so I, I'm just ready to go doing it from the command line. It makes me happy. Excellent. Well, uh, with my work hat on, I do a lot of Git stuff over SSH, oh, at which point okay. you don't have a client, right? So you're in on the terminal all the time. And it really is very liberating, empowering even, yeah, to, to be able to do it on the command line. I think that's a really great word to use for the terminal itself. It's liberating. It's, it's powerful. It, it gives you yeah. something you don't have. It seems like it's more limited, but almost its limitations are its strength in some ways. I don't know. It can do pretty much everything. Yeah. Just matter of finding the right magic word. All right. So as I say, this one is kind of bittersweet. This is our last bit of new content, but it's, it's, it's actually rather important because as you start to write bigger things, you find yourself copying and pasting the same piece of code multiple times in your script. And that sets off all of your, this is a bad smell from a software engineering point of view thing. And in JavaScript, you would have immediately gone, this is either a function or a class. And I have been finding it ever more difficult in examples and in sample uh, homework and stuff not to use functions because I find myself doing the same thing multiple times. And then it's like, this is wrong. I should do it right, but I can't do it right because we haven't talked about functions and we can't talk about functions unless we talk about scope and scope and bash is weird. And I've been a little bit afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm kind of glad I had a couple of extra weeks on this one. So I'm, I'm much more comfortable now. In my talk at uh, MacStock this last week, it was about how I learned by teaching and I used you as an example of how you say that you're often one step ahead of the audience, you know, one week ahead as you're learning stuff. So you've learned a lot in this sequence, too. I have. I absolutely have. So today we're going to learn how to use POSIX functions, because POSIX is a superset of Bash, and Bash has its own special syntax that only works in Bash, or we can use the POSIX syntax that will work in Bash and SH and ZSH, and lots of other places too. So I was like, well, I'm only going to learn one or I'll confuse myself. So let us learn the POSIX way so that our knowledge is portable. And then the other thing is, yeah, we'll get to lexical versus dynamic scope a little bit later, but let's start with functions. But before we even do that, I did set you a challenge last time, which is a bit of a cheat of a challenge because the challenge was to take your existing sample solution for our multiplication table printer script and to rewrite it to make use of xargs and or arithmetic expressions as appropriate to your particular code. But of course, I used my example to show why xargs is great. So I'd already done the xargs part of the assignment. Cheater. 
cheater a bit. Yeah, so all I ended up doing, now I have included my full sample solution in the zip file, uh, pbs152-challengesolution.sh. Uh, so for me, it was about changing the mathematics into uh, math- arithmetic expression. So instead of writing a str- of echoing a string and piping it to the basic calculator BC, which is a bit messy, instead I was just using the dollar paren paren and then writing out the mathematical equation properly and then catching the value that way, which does make nicer code. Let's be honest. Right. Right. So. The other thing that that let me do in the challenge solution was to revisit one of those little things I told you to turn into a text expander snippet and not to think about too much, which is that every time we're finished with optargs, sorry, with getting optional arguments, um, yeah, with optargs, um, sorry, get opts. Why did my show notes say optargs? It should say get opts. Oh, um, fix that. Yes, that's interesting. So every time we use get opts, we have to finish afterwards with this little bit of boilerplate that basically says, take all of the optional arguments that may or may not exist and take them off the front of the array of arguments so that they're out of our way and then continue the script so that dollar one and dollar two are the normal arguments. And so we've been doing that with the shift keyword and then we've been telling the shift keywords to use the value which we compute by echoing opt int, opt ind, which is the index for get opt, minus one, and piping that to the basic calculator, which is really weird looking code. (laughs) We can replace that with the much nicer shift, dollar paren paren, opt in minus one paren paren. I think you were really mean to teach us that basic calculator first and then show us, yeah, arithmetic's here. (laughs) Well, you were already cranky that there were so many brackets and they meant so many things. I was like, no, I'm going to keep this one on the back boiler for a bit. That there is too much confusion happening here. Okay, and fine. I, I stand by that decision. Sure. So let us jump into functions. And the first thing I'm going to do is say that all of us are at a disadvantage because we know how to program in other languages and we think we know what the function is because we've come from JavaScript or PHP or all these kind of languages. And in those languages, a function takes its input through arguments and gives its output as a value that is returned. And we use the return keyword to return that value. But in Bash, functions don't really work like that. Think of them as a script within a script, or think of them as a custom terminal command. They want their input primarily via standard in. They want their output via standard out. And they do return something. They return an exit code. They don't return a value. They return an exit code. And so you use the return keyword not to return your value. And that's going to drive you nuts. Okay. So the normal way to return your value is just to echo it. So it goes the standard out. Oh, And then whoever's using your function will use the standard terminal plumbing to to take standard out and... Oh, yeah, what do they okay. want to do? Is this the middle of a pipeline? Do we want this to go to a file? Do we want this to go to a variable? You don't know. And arguably, the function shouldn't care. The function's job is to make some data exist and put it on standard out. Okay. Now, just like terminal commands do have arguments, bash functions do have arguments. But don't think you have to send everything in through an argument, right? Bash functions... You know, Terminal commands really like to use standard in, so Hmm. so should your functions. So think of your function as a custom terminal command. I wish there was a terminal command to do blah, blah, blah. Let me make one. Function. Okay. So that's how you should think of them. They're custom terminal commands. Okay. So we're going to learn the POSIX syntax. And there's another thing we're at a disadvantage of. So the POSIX syntax is name of function space, open parens, close parens, space, open a curly bracket, all of the commands that make up your function, close your curly bracket. Those two parens, to you and me and to everyone else who's done JavaScript or C or Java or Perl or PHP, or I could list a million more languages, we think that the names of our arguments go in the parens, right? That's what we're used to. Think of those parentheses as one single character that means nothing more than this is a function. It is just a marker to say, this is a function. Nothing goes in there. They have, they are purely ornamental. (laughs) They serve no function. 
<laughs> other than to say, I'm a function. Yeah, I have a little confession to make. It was a very long into time into programming by stealth before I actually ever put anything inside the parentheses. I sort of always thought of it as, as just a, uh, <laughs> you know, this is just to tell me that that's a function. So Dorothy was always okay. throwing stuff inside her parentheses, and I was always like, well, I'm, I'm afraid to do that. I don't know what that means. Well, I guess if you go back to your old self, you'll be just fine, because in, in Bash land, or in POSIX land, they are just there to demarcate this thing I'm about to make as a function. And so it's basically name of function, the two parens, and then curly brackets to, to contain our function. At least it's curly brackets. <laughs> At least that much makes sense to us. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. So the easiest way is to show... So let us start with a very simple function um, that, what am I, what, yeah, so it's a simple function to do hello world because I think that's compulsory. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, there are laws. We must obey all laws. There are laws. So our function is going to simply print out hello world on one line and then on the next line it's going to print out inside parens from inside a POSIX function, just so that our function isn't too tidy. So the script itself you will find in pbs153a-fn.sh and the script itself will call our function three times by default or if we pass our script a number it will call our function that many times so we can see our function do its thing multiple times and I say in the show notes I'm going to do it once by default and then I think I wrote my code to do it but I, I, fixed, I fixed it in the show notes. You, you had it in the show notes as uh, you must be with missing one pull because it does say function counter equals one. And that's what it said. In, yeah, but my actually in the, in the file, it actually says one. Yes. Okay. So the, okay. Uh, is it the file or the show notes? Because it should both. say one. So I'm they wondering... both say one now. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Okay. I did actually pull. Yeah, I'm curious. We might be, we'll have to double check that. I'll make a note for us to check that after the show. But uh, yeah, it said okay, three. Okay, good. And I was sample like, output. I was like, how is it three? But it says one. But I, fi I fixed yeah, it. Yeah, it is one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the sample output in the show notes also clearly shows it as one. So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, okay. So looking then at the Fun the definition for our function is simply hello w, which is what I named my function, space, our two parens, space, curly bracket, and then echo hello world, echo from inside the POSIX function. And that's it. And to call the function, we just treat it like any other terminal command on planet Earth. We just say the name of the function, and it will call the function. Okay. And that really is all there is to it. Okay. Well, that, that looks like it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Sorry, I can't multitask. <laughs> I was just sending Bart a little note room. telling him that something's dinging in his room. Heard it a couple of times. so uh, Which it shouldn't be because I have personal focus on, but I guess I'll switch you to do not disturb, which is okay. even more restrictive Good. personal focus. Right. Ooh, ah! Ooh, didn't mean to put my screensaver on. That definitely doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> the audience is like, what are they doing? These clowns, have they never done this before? <laughs> yeah, you think not. Anyway, interesting. Okay, so we just uh, call okay. the, we just call the function by just saying the name of it. We don't. There's no parentheses. Just say no, the name No of it. two parentheses for that. Just no, nope, because again, it's a custom terminal command. Just think of it as I wrote a terminal command. Okay, so like cat doesn't have parentheses on it. You know, ls doesn't have parentheses. Uh, one of the exactly. things exactly. Tell Bart before we started. He named his function hello with a w, which I thought was hilarious because I always misspell hello and my fingers just want to put a w on the end of it so i thought he had done that and i started fixing it all over the place and then i realized no it was hello world <laughs> it's gonna make my brain even hurt even more so uh that'll be even harder yeah the other thing just to draw your attention to since it's new in our exploration of bash is i am making a point in my examples this this installment to make heavy use of arithmetic expressions to help bed them in so when I decrement my counter inside my while loop, I'm using double round parens without the dollar sign because I don't want the value of, I just wanted to do the action. So take my counter and decrement it. Um, Good. Yeah, that actually helped when I saw it again, when I was pre-reading the show notes to see that you're using the arithmetic expressions. I like it. 
Excellent. And just a reminder that if you put the dollar in front of the arithmetic expression, you get the answer of the math. And if you don't put the dollar, you get the exit code. So that means we can use the arithmetic expressions for conditionals, like, for example, only printing an empty line unless we're at the last hello world. So it says round paren, round paren, fn counter greater than zero, round paren, round paren, and, and echo blank string. So that, so that so means, that means uh, take the, if the function counter is still greater than zero and it started, say, at three, it goes three, two, one, it's going to echo it. And mm -hmm. as soon as it gets to zero. So we're not getting the, uh, we are getting the execution of the function. So what we're getting there, because we didn't put a dollar in front of it, we're basically getting true or false or rather success or fail. Oh, from oh, the greater than. Oh, from the greater than, but function counter is a value that's getting decremented. So it's, it's just well, a variable. Actually, uh, the line it's above a variable. it, yeah. yeah the l it's just a Correct. variable. Correct, yes, function right? counter okay. is a variable. Okay, yes. got it. Yes, because also, as a reminder, inside, inside an arithmetic expression, you don't give functions the dollar sign, because it's like, this is math. If it isn't numbers, it's a variable. Right. Because the only thing allowed inside your two parentheses is math. So in math universe, you don't need to say dollar $x, you just say X. Right, right. Again, it's Bash trying to be helpful, but it does have the side effect of sometimes being confusing, which yeah. is why I'm making a point of repeating it. Okay, so every function is like a script within a script, I said, or like a custom terminal command. Well, we know that our script gets its very own copy of standard in, standard out, and standard error. And every time our script calls another script or calls a command, on a terminal command, that command gets its own copy of standard in, standard out, and standard error, which is why we can use the pipes to manipulate these things, right? The standard out from the cat command is piped into the standard in of the grep command or whatever. Sure. So they each have their own. Okay. Functions are like terminal commands. So every time you run a function, that running copy of the function gets its very own standard in, standard out, and standard error. And what they're connected to completely depends on how you call your function. So if you put your function into the middle of a pipe, then your function standard in will be whatever the pipe has just connected to it. Sure. If you, if you like if you just call a command without doing any terminal plumbing, then the standard in for the command is your standard in. The same is true with the function. If you just use standard in without a pipe, then the function has the same standard in your script hat. So it just inherits it, but it does have its own one. So that's just, just you know, to note. And also, it can write the standard out, and it's its own standard out. So you can use it inside the pipe, just like you can any other terminal command. So it, it basically, it behaves like you expect, is what I'm trying to say in very convoluted ways. It, it works like it should. So the next example I'm going to give is a little function. So you're going to find that in PBS 135B, FN streams, where we're going to write a bash function that uses the streams, that uses standard in and standard out to be terminal-like. And we're going to write a function that is a terminal command called pal, which is short for palindrome, that's going to take some input from standard in, and it's going to print it the right way around once, and then immediately follow with it backwards. So it becomes a palindrome because you print it forward and then backward. So uh, you're on mute, Alison. I hope that's intended. Ah, I was moving my chair a minute ago and didn't want to make a racket. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so our function is going, to min is going to take its input from standard in and then write its output to standard out. So inside the function, again, we just say pal, open friends, close friends, curly. So mm -hmm. we're, name, we're saying make me a new function named pal, and all the rest is just window dressing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we do inside our function is we read from whatever happens to be the function standard input, which will be different every time you call the function. Sometimes you might call it inside a pipe, sometimes you might call it inside a script. The function doesn't know what it will be. It just knows it will have a standard input. And we want to take that standard input and save it in a variable, which I'm choosing to call str for string, because it really could be anything, right? Okay. We're just going to sure. palindromize. So we're using the cat function, we, the cat command, which by default reads standard in and prints the standard out, and we're catching it with the dollar parens syntax. So we're basically saying the output of the cat command, save it in this variable called str. Okay. And then we're going to print that variable as is without a trailing new line. So echo minus n for minus no new line. Mm -hmm. And then we have to reverse it. 
So there is a terminal command called rev which reverses things. So we're going to echo our string and pipe it to rev. Why does that exist? That seems like such an odd thing. I mean, it's perfect for this little example, but why does it exist? I generally find that if something might be useful somewhere, so the, the terminal thinks of itself as a bunch of Lego bricks and you can build any castle you want. I Someone guess. thought that would be an idea, so there it is. So that's our entire function. So it reads from standard in and it just uses the echo command for its output, right? So you'd be used to in JavaScript creating a string, building up the string and then returning the string. But here, the primary output mechanism is standard out. So just echo the stuff, just echo it. That is how you give output from your functions in the normal course of things. Okay. Different, not difficult, but different. So how do we use our function? Well, the easiest way to use it is to pipe something to it. So we're going to say echo your palindromic username. And then we're going to send, we're going to so the, the variable dollar user in all caps is one of those variables that exist in every Unixy system, which is your username. So we're going to take the result of running the command echo dollar user pipe pal and then print that out after the word zero palindromic username. So basically the bit that's actually going to pal is echo dollar user pipe pal. So we're going to send your username to our new function. Okay. And it will write to its standard out. The dollar parens is going to capture that and print it out as a string as part of the echo command that came before it. So when you run this script, you will see that it does what it says in the tin. Now, we also then give another example of using our function within a pipeline. So it's not at the end of a pipe, it's in the middle of a pipe. And so we're going to write the host name in all caps. So we're going to take the hostname command, which will just print your hostname. We're going to pipe that to our pal function. So our pal function receives our hostname. It will write to it standard out, which we're now going to pipe to the transliterate command, tr, which is going to take all the lowercase a to z's and transliterate them to uppercase a to z's. So in other words, convert them to uppercase. And so when you echo that out, pal host, which is the variable we're saving all this into, is going to be the uppercase shouty version of our computer's name. So if you run that script, I guess yours is going to say Alison Sniliat or whatever no, Alison backwards says, is. Oh, come on. You know what Alison backwards is? Oh, no, Silla. <laughs> 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 there probably isn't anybody else whose name you absolutely should know what it is backwards. Yeah, so it says Allison Nocella, and then it writes uh, my computer name and then runs it right into itself backwards, and the whole thing's in all caps. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, it's not an exciting sense. function. No, but I like yeah. it as an example, but it, it does just what you would expect it to do. Precisely. So, we have made a terminal command, right? Whenever we're writing functions, we're making terminal commands and we're being all terminally. And we are using the streams. Yeah. So the other very terminally thing is exit codes, right? If you need to communicate success or failure, you do that through an exit code. An exit code of zero means all good and any other exit code means not happy. So we're going to, a very common thing you might want to customize your exit codes on is a function to test something. Is this a da 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 da? Well, that's a very much a success fail sort of answer. So exit codes are a fantastic mechanism for communicating that. So our third example, uh, 153C FN return, is going to show how we can use the return keyword to do two things. It stops the function in its tracks and ends the function with the return code we give it. So it's exactly like the exit command for a script, but instead of ending the whole script, it just ends the function. Okay. Okay. So if there were other code further down, it would never happen, right? So you might say, if some condition returns zero, and that will just stop executing the function. Like in JavaScript, you can at any point say, return my string, but, and that will stop the function running. But it's not going to stop it's the only script. Exit code. It's just going to stop this function from running. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. So the exit command would stop the whole script. The return command stops the function with the appropriate exit code. So we're going to write a very boring function called is underscore int, which is going to check if something is an integer. So we are going to take our input from standard in, and we're not going to write anything to standard out. We're just simply going to return the exit code zero if it is an integer or one if it is not an integer. So again, is in space, paren, paren, space, curly. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to start by taking whatever is in standard in, which is what the cat command does if you don't give it any arguments, and we're going to pipe that to egrep, which we're going to tell to be quiet. So minus Q for just be quiet, egrep, just give me a return code, don't print anything to the screen. And the pattern we'd like it to match is starts with an optional minus sign and then one or more digits. Okay. And then we're going to do that ampersand ampersand thing and then return zero. So if the egrep evaluates to, to true, then we will go ahead and return zero, which means all is okay. Because in Bash world, everything's upside down. <laughs> yeah, that, that was what that pause up. was, because you're going, wait a minute, it should be oh, yeah. around. So zero is true, yeah. one is false. Yeah, so zero is success. I like success. to say success, success in my head. So, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's easier. Or no error. It's, zero is absence of error. Okay. That's actually where it comes from. Okay, that's, that's better. And then, so assuming the grep matches, our function will cease at that point. It will say, I'm happy, and it will stop running. Oh, because you did a return. Because I did a return. Okay. If that has not happened, I am not happy, then the second line in the function happens, return one. But it still stops. Yes, there is an error. It still stops. It stops yeah, no we're matter what. Done now. Okay. Yes. Well, but, and in fact, it would stop even if we didn't do anything else, but, you know. Oh, okay. I see. I, I was a little confused by just the way this was formatted. It looked like this was all what everything that was in the script, but actually that's too, you're, you're doing, you're running it. No, is that, is that all in the script? Uh, so the, the function, so the whole script is what's in the show notes, which is just a tiny little four line function followed by us actually using the function. And that's. That's uh, what's coming next. So check some values. That's, it's us in, using that's the inside the, that's inside the script. Inside the script, yes, not inside the function. Okay, okay. Oh, right, 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 right. So the function is stopped, but the, but the script can have more stuff in it. In case this is going to be the input. It, it, that's odd. You did the input stuff afterwards. Well, right, you define a function, then you use it. Yeah, okay. Right? Okay. All we've done okay. here is define yeah. the function. So now it exists. Right? Okay. You, can't, you can't use a function until it exists. JavaScript does clever things like it. JavaScript will read all of your file and then pretend you'd written the function definitions at the top. It's called hoisting. Hmm. So when it goes to run your code, all of your functions are at the top of your file. doesn't matter where you wrote them. When JavaScript runs them, they're all at the top of the file. Oh. But in Bash, you better define them before you use them or Bash is going to go, hmm, oh, no. Ah. What are you talking about? Is int? Never heard of that. Okay, but you, uh, you haven't walked through the second half of this, but you don't ever... Correct. You don't ever use the oh, function. No, we, I do. I do. Many times. Every time you see is underscore int for the rest of the file, we're calling I, our function. I don't, Remember, I don't see is underscore int in the second half of this block of code that we're looking at. Um... So inside the do, on the first line inside the do, we use it. Oh, oh, there it is. Fact, yeah, that's okay. True. All right, good. It is there. Couldn't see it. Yeah. Again, you're, you're looking for parentheses. I am. Because you're I so, am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. That's what's wrong. Okay. Yeah. So you got to get into the habit that we're making custom terminal commands here. Custom terminal yeah. command, custom terminal command. So in order to test our function, we should run it against some values. And I got lazy of copying and pasting. So I made an array with my test values and then I looped through my array. So my array contains the values 42, which is an integer, 4.5, which is not an integer, minus 1, which is an integer, and waffles, which is most certainly not an integer. But I would like an integer of waffles. One, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no minus one. No waffles for you. No. So we then loop over it with a standard for loop. So for val in, and then our, that syntax we all love so much to get up all the values in an, in a, in an array into a loop. A dollar parens name of array open square bracket at close square bracket closer curly brackets it's lovely syntax catwalk across the keyboard syntax okay pretty much anyway so, so, so then we say inside our for loop we're saying if and then we're piping our value into our isn't function so if echo dollar val pipe isn't so we're, we're making standard in for our function be our variable that we're testing mm -hmm. and then we're echoing out either the value is an integer else the value is not an integer. So that okay. will then run four times. And when you run it, you will see that it says that 42 is an integer, 4.5 is not an integer, minus one is an integer, and waffles is not an integer. Good. So there we go. So that is an example of us using exit codes. Again, we're behaving just like a terminal command because that's what we're doing here. We're making our own terminal commands. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I both know that terminal commands can take arguments. Sure, 
they work on standard in for a lot of their work and they work on standard out for most of their output, but they can take arguments. LS most certainly can take an argument of what folder would you like me to list? If you don't give it anything, it will do something sensible, but it can take arguments. You can give it flags, optional arguments or flags, like minus A for show me everything, minus L for give me a long listing. So we know we can have arguments. So of course our functions can do the same. And the way it works is that as well as each of our functions getting their own standard in, standard out, and standard error, they also get their own dollar octosorp for how many arguments was I given, dollar oh. at for all of my arguments, and dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, etc. So all of those special variables we've been using as the arguments to our script, every function gets their own copy of that self same set of arguments. Wait so a minute, Bart, are, you, know, are you saying that these functions are like we've written our own terminal commands? Mm. <laughs> they are. You, and you should also think earlier. of your scripts the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's terminal commands all the way down, folks. <laughs> so, so that actually means we already know how to use our arguments because we've done it before. Yeah. So let us now make our isint function a little bit more clever. So just like the cat command, we'll either print whatever's on standard in to standard out, or if we give the cat command some arguments, it will use those arguments instead of standard in. Right. So why don't we have our isInt function say, did I get any arguments? If I got arguments, then I should check if they're all integers. And if they're all integers, then I'm going to be happy. So I'm going to return success. If even one of them is not, I'm going to return error. Okay. So let us start by first off. So our function is a little bit longer this time because we're making it do some things here. So th for the first time, our function actually stretches to about 15 or 20 lines here. <laughs> so the first thing we do inside isInt is we make a variable named int or e for int regular expression so that I don't have to keep copying and pasting that lovely bit of gibberish that means starts with an optional minus followed by one or more digits. Please tell me that's, I'm not a gonna read out. that's a text expander snippet by now. Do you know what isn't? Because I typed, I am so fluent in regex language that it's easier for me to type without remembering an abbreviation. Wow. I don't know if that's something to be proud of or ashamed of, but I, <laughs> I really, I have a t-shirt that has to be or not to be as a regular expression. <laughs> it's, it's stupendously nerdy. I love it. I love and it. I use it as like a one, a one t-shirt test and so far four people have laughed. <laughs> like, I like you, you're my people. <laughs> anyway. Okay. I have saved my regular expression. This is, again, avoid code reuse. Because if I made a mistake, if I copied and pasted that instead of making it a variable, I would have to find everywhere I made the same mistake. Whereas by saving it as a variable, I only make the mistake, or I have one place to correct my, my inevitable mistakes. It's good practice. Anyway, so we save our regular expression. And the first thing we need to do is figure out, do we have more than zero arguments? If we have zero, we want to read from standard in. Otherwise, we want to do something else. So the first thing is we say if, and then inside of our square brackets, so we can test a condition, we're going to test if dollar octothorp or dollar pound or dollar hash or whatever we're calling it this week is greater than zero. So the greater than is minus GT if we're inside our test command. So the square brackets are our test command. And, and so basically, which one is if, dollar octothorp? What does that mean again? Is that all of that the is arguments? The number of. The number of arguments. No, all got of. You, got you. It's yeah. got a, oh, good. It's got a number symbol. Yeah, it's one I can remember. <laughs> so if that is true, we're going to do something new. So put a pin in that for about 15 seconds. Else we want to do exactly what we did before, which is process standard in. So I copied and pasted from the previous, I didn't copy and paste, the previous script I used as my starting point, and these are the two lines that remain. <laughs> um, and all the rest was built around those two lines. So they are exactly what we had before because processing standard in is just like it always was. Okay. So the other part of the if is new. Okay, so we did have an argument. There is something to process in the arguments. What shall we do? We shall loop over the arguments. So for val in open single, oh sorry, open double quote, dollar at close double quote, which is our syntax for exploding our arguments into the loop. Okay. So each time we go through the loop, val, the variable $val will contain the argument we're processing at the moment. Okay. And so we're going to take the current value we're testing, we're going to pipe it to egrep, we're going to shove it through our regular expression, and now we're going to invert our logic. So previously we said and and return zero, 
because there was only one thing to test. So we could just do that. It was like, well, this matches our egg expression. Great, we're done. Well, if I want to say all the arguments have to be integers, then I can't just say, I can't declare victory when the first one checks out. You know, I've won the battle, but not the war, right? Okay. So I need to flip my logic around here. And so what I'm saying here is I am only going to exit the function if I fail. Because okay. if even one of them fails, we're done, right? They can't all be integers be first, if one second, of them isn't. Third, fourth, it doesn't matter. As soon as you hit one, return one. Precisely. So now instead of saying ampersand, ampersand, return zero, I'm saying or return one. So I've, I've inverted my logic. Okay. I've done a little Boolean trick there. Now, if we make it the whole way to the end of the loop and we have not exited the function, then they must all have passed. They must all have been integers. So therefore, I now end that part of my if statement with return zero. Okay. I just thought of something. Uh, your else is taking the uh, the form of processing standard in that you did in your previous example. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I forget, did you have it be that they all had to be... Uh, no, your previous example, they didn't all have to be uh, integers. Right, because standard in is one thing. Oh. Standard in has a value, so it was simpler. We just had a value to test. Well, now we could have one arg or five args or a million args. So that's why it's more complicated. Okay, but you're going to get two different answers from this. If you sent it the same four values, your 42 minus one pancakes and, and uh, whatever the other one, 4.5, if you sent it those as uh, arguments, you would get false. You would get, no, Correct. there's no integers. But the second test, if you don't, it, within the same function, if you are the same script, I'm sorry, if you don't give it any arguments, it's going to actually to answer you four times. It's not going to take the collective. Only if you call it four times. Well, you're giving, no, it, no. you're giving it four. Right, but we did it in a loop. So each time we called it last time, we, gave, we, we called it with one value. We piped a single value into standard in. If we pipe all the values into standard in, they'll arrive as one big string which is gobbledygook. So it's actually it's going to behave exactly like it did last time. I know. I'm saying it is going to behave exactly like last time. But the first half of your function, if you get, you're going to get two different ways of looking at the problem. You could give it the same four arguments. If you gave it as arguments, it'll come back false. It'll say you failed. But if you, but if you don't give it any arguments, it'll give you one success and three fails. Even though they were the same four values. No, not quite. So if you call, so last time we called the function four times mm -hmm. with one value each time. Mm -hmm. If we do the same thing and call the function four times with one argument each time, we will get exactly the same output. But yes. if we're interested in answering a bigger question. So basically what we have now done is we've made our script more powerful. It can answer the question, is this one thing an int? Or it can answer a new question it couldn't answer before. Are these all integers? Which is a different, but which is a more powerful this, question. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm showing off that I understand how this works ah, by saying okay. that you're getting two different answers from the same, from the same uh, set of data. Given those four inputs. Fair. If you give them as arguments, you'll get one answer. But if you don't give them as arguments, you're going to get four separate answers. That is completely true. And it is also true that if you give them as an argument one at a time, you'll also get the four separate answers. True, true. Okay. Interesting. So, yes. Uh, now, okay, so we can use our self same for loop as last time, but this time we're going to say instead of instead of piping and stuff to it, we're just going to call our function directly. So the code is much cleaner. If is int dollar val. Well, how? That's a lot easier than saying if echo dollar val pipe is int. That's mm -hmm. faffing about. We just say if is int dollar val. Oh, hey, that's much more English. Then echo yes, else echo no. Okay. It's nice and clean. We can also shove it multiple values now. So we can say if is int 42 minus 1, then echo all integers, else echo not all integers. And we can also send it 11 and waffles, and then echo all integers or not all integers. So when you run that code, what you will get is the nice, clean uh, answers basically that the first two are all, you know, the first time. Sorry, let me say all that again. The first loop through, we get exactly what we had before. Yes, no, yes, no. The second time when we call it with 42 and minus one, we get, yep, they're all integers. And then we call it with 11 and waffles, we get, nope, 
Not all integers, because waffles is not an integer. Okay. So what I sort of wanted to draw your attention to is that the same function is int within that example there is called in three different ways, right? We can say if echo dollar val pipe is int and it works just fine because we're taking standard in and our function handles that. Or we can say if is int a single argument and it works just fine. Or we can say if is int with two arguments and it works just fine. So we're now starting to write something which behaves awfully like a real world terminal command. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I need to bring us to variable scope. Dun, dun, because dun. we have unwittingly created spooky action at a distance. We have been using variables inside our functions with gay abandon, and I have had to be stupendously careful in these examples. These examples work despite the fact that I have not taken into account how, ja how Bash's scope works. This These is where you want to back up and give that, that uh, description that we inserted at the beginning? Uh, this is where I'm leading into that description in about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so at the moment, our code works because I have been really careful to use unique variable names everywhere and never have a clash because all those variables are global. All of them. They're all globals. Hmm. And so they would all stomp on each other. Because bash by default makes every variable a global variable, which is sort of the, the big picture view of a mechanism for handling scope that is known as dynamic scope which nothing we have used before uses dynamic scope. We have lived in a universe of, well, I don't think I've ever told you we use lexical scope or static scope as it's also known. No. But we have been. And the reason I haven't said it is A, because very few computer scientists even speak that kind of jargon. And almost every language that you're ever going to come across, with the sole exception to my knowledge of shell script, is lexically scoped because... That's how our humans tend and to work. So what is, what is lexically scoped? What's that so definition? Lexical means wordy things, right? A lexical analysis is you're analyzing the word. So a lexical scope, where in the code your variable is defined, determines the variable's scope. Okay. So you're used to me saying to you, if I define a variable inside the function, it comes into being at the opening curly bracket and ceases to exist at the closing curly bracket. Right. So it is lexically scoped in your source code within its containing curly brackets. Okay. And no matter how deep you nest the variable, the curly brackets are always what's giving it its lexical scope. So the line on the file tells you the scope. So lexical and st uh, slash static, which are synonyms in this mm -hmm. case... Static is the opposite of dynamic, but neither one of those sound like where I define it matters versus it doesn't matter where I define it. But it those are, right. So what be, is the other I'm word have view? have to come back to the, to the definition every time because those words don't mean that. I, I mean, know. They do mean that. But again, that, they're hard they, to define. English, yeah, yeah. It's hard to, like, I don't like the names. But I can't think of a better one. Yeah. Okay, so let me <laughs> see if I can say it again, because we've been talking a lot about it. Static slash lexical is where, uh, like JavaScript, where, where you define it, that defines its scope. But dynamic means it's always global? Uh, n yes, and. Okay. There's, there's a very important and here. So with, what makes dynamic scope dynamic is that the scope is figured out by how your function is called. So if you, if you have a variable called waffles mm -hmm. and that variable is inside a function inside a script, depending on how you call that function, waffles may have a different value. So you could have another function called pancakes and pancakes could set the variable waffles to 42 and then call the function waffles and then waffles will see i've mixed up my names here horribly <laughs> that's okay i lost Let you us the say waffles the, anyway <laughs> yeah the, we're going to say the variable is called waffles and the functions are called function one and function two okay how's that all right so we have a variable called waffles and 
If I say in my script, waffles becomes equal to 42, and then inside function one, I print out the value of waffles, it will get the 42 because it was set in the function before I, because it was set in the script before I called the function. Okay. If in function two, I have a line that says waffles becomes equal to minus one, and then the next line is call function one, then the value is actually going to be minus one. Oh, come on. The code hasn't changed. Hmm. Where I call the code affects the value it sees. That's horrible. (laughs) It's horrible until you think about how shell scripts work. And then it makes perfect sense. Because we have been using this dynamical scope all along. We just haven't known it. So by default, everything is global. But it doesn't have to be. Oh, you okay. can expressly say, I want to make these variables local to me. So inside your function, you say to Bash, these variables are mine. I want my own copy of these. But you then create a new universe. So every function or terminal command you call inside your function sees your value. So it's okay. like you're casting a shadow. Right, so there was a global mm. value, and you made a new value, and you're casting a shadow on everything you call. Okay. And if something you call changes the value, it can make another littler scope. Okay. For everything it calls, and okay. cast a shadow inside the shadow inside the shadow. Okay. So you're projecting down. So now think about how variables like the input file separator work. Ifs. So mm. I have told you to be really wary of messing with ifs because ifs is global. I haven't told you about functions. If you would like to use ifs within a function, you are 100% safe to do so as long as you localize it. So if you localize say... Localize it. Local ifs, which we're going to get to the syntax in a second. Okay. But if you basically say, I want to make my own ifs, then your spooky action at a distance is gone. Oh. Because now your change only applies inside your function and everything you call from your function. So if you want to make the input separator be the comma instead of the new line character, if you do it inside a function and you expressly say, make it a local variable, spooky action at a distance evaporates because you haven't messed with all the rest of your script, right? Okay. It's only being constrained by your function. So when you're writing functions that use variables, you always have to ask yourself, global or do I want my own? Okay. So probably be and safer to do local unless you're sure you want it global. Bing, bing, bing. Okay. So by default, you should get into the habit of starting every function with, with a line that localizes your variables. So the syntax to say this one is local is the keyword local, followed by the names of one or more variables. And just like with a for loop, we don't say, we don't say for dollar $val, we say for $val in, you say local var1 var2, not dollar $var1, dollar $var2. It's just the names of the variables. And so we can use those to localize our variables. Okay. Now, I have jumped the gun slightly on the show notes because it just was, the English it flowed, was better. It, that flowed really well. Okay. It did, and I wasn't going to stop myself just because my show notes were yeah, in different I, order. I noticed that, and then so, I went, no, it's working. <laughs> so now I'm going to, I have told you what I want to tell you. Now I'm going to show you that I'm not talking poop. <laughs> So, okay. if you were unaware of this reality of how Bash works, and you naively wrote a function to, say, add an optional argument to our isInt, right? So, the, the getOps command manipulates $1, etc. Well, every function gets its own $1 and $2, so you would immediately assume that getOps will work just fine within a function. And it does. But it won't work just fine without spooky action at a distance if you don't remember to localize things. So we're going to do it without localizing things so we break everything. Okay. So we are going to make our isInt function take one optional argument, a flag, minus a. And if that flag is set, then we will accept any integer instead of all integers. So in our previous one, if you gave it three values, they all had to be integers. If you say minus a, then any can be an integer. So effectively, an or instead of an and. Okay. 
seems like a reasonable thing to do. So if we just take the syntax we're used to and we shove it in our function before we do the test for whether or not we have any arguments, we do the normal get up stuff. So I'm still saving my regular expression to a variable called int or e because I still want that. Mm -hmm. I'm making another variable called any okay and I'm setting it to the empty string. That's just going to be my variable to, to know whether or not we're in anything or everything mode. Right? Okay. It's just my variable to hold that fact. Then we're going to use get opts, and the pattern is colon, ooh, colon a, no colon, tut, 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 typo Bart. What, what should it be? Just a, because a doesn't need a value. And no colon after? No co yeah, so colon a for, I want my own error messages, but a is a flag that doesn't take a value. Yeah, so okay. So just colon a. Okay. So while get ups a, so while get ups, our pattern is colon a, and then we're going to save the current value in a variable called opt. And then we're going to do our usual case opt in. If it's an A, we set any OK to be one. Otherwise, we print out our error message. And instead of saying exit one, we say return one, because we don't want to kill the whole script just because they used the function wrong. We just want to end the function. So that's the only thing that's changed here from what we're used to. And then we have our code like before for the most part but we've added in an extra if statement to say, if any is okay, we need to do a third type of logic. So we're still gonna have a loop, but this time we say, if we find any one that is a valid integer, we can immediately jump to success without testing anymore. Oh, okay. So we now have a third, a third different convoluted way of having this logic, okay. right? So we have if statements inside if statements, but it's it's just logic, right? It's 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 nothing new to us. And if we run this function, the first time we call the function, everything is fine. It does exactly what we want. So we call the function with multiple arguments. We don't give it a minus a, and it quite correctly gives us the answer we expect. And the second time we call it with the minus a, and it still works fine. It still says, there's, yeah, there's at least one integer in your list of test values. And then the third time we call it without the minus a, with exactly the same input we used before, and now it barfs. It gives us a dumb error message. What? Why? How? The answer is because the way getOpt works is it uses a variable called optInt to count where it is in the list of arguments. How far have I gotten looking for my optional flags? That's how we can do that little optIn minus one trick at the end. Right. So the optIn is counting. It's a global variable. Okay. So the first time we call our function, optIn starts at zero and moves forward until it meets the minus a. Right. The second time we call our function, there is no minus, so optIn doesn't move, but it's not at zero. It's still sitting out here in the middle. The third time we call our function, Optin is not at the start of our argument list, it's in the middle of our argument list, and the first thing it meets is minus one, which is our test value. And it goes, what? Minus one? That's not in my list. Error. So, Because it, it's a global variable. Okay. I, I think I lost you at how optin is being used as an input to this function. Not to this function, to get opt. GetOpts uses optIn. OptIn belongs to GetOpts. Okay. But we never... So when you say while GetOpts... Right. GetOpts is using... GetOpts says start OptIn at zero. Mm -hmm. So GetOpts... The first time GetOpts runs, OptIn is at its default value of no value. So GetOpts says, oh, there is no OptIn. Great, make it zero. Okay. And it uses, it uses OptIn to remember how far it's gotten on the list of arguments. Inside that while loop, we say while get opts. Okay, right. okay. Let, using me, opt let me see if I get it. So when you're shifting it, you're doing that while it's also changing? The reason we can shift is because get opts has been changing the value of opt in. So why is it barfing again? <laughs> we're, so we're, the first time we call our function, everything is as, opt in, as, as get opts expects. Mm-hmm. Right, So we call our function three times. The first right. time with a minus a. Mm -hmm. So the first time with a minus a, opt, get opt does everything it normally would. So it slowly counts opt in and it goes, how far do I get? I get as far as 
uh, wherever minus a appears in the argument list. And so the value of opt-in is going to be two, I think. Okay. I'm just, it doesn't matter. The value of opt-in is not zero. It okay. is wherever minus a appeared in the argument list. And right. we shift by that amount minus one. Right. The second time we call our function, we don't give it a minus a. So get opts doesn't actually move opt-in because there is nothing, there oh, are no minuses sorry. to process. Just got it. Okay. That's that's where the The third happens. time. Okay. Yeah. The third time we go through the loop, oopsie daisies. We now start to look for our options and the first option we find is minus one. Okay. Which okay. is garbage. Right. It goes all wrong. So do we have to localize opt-in? Yes, we do. Huh. We have to localize every variable we use inside this function. Okay. We have oh, to everyone. localize int or e. Every single variable, right? Oh, we wow. don't want any global variables leaking out of this function, right? Like you say, unless you explicitly want it to be global, unless there's a reason you want to address something global, you shouldn't. So by default, localize all your variables unless you intentionally want to project something into the global scope. Okay. So basically, you go through your code and every time you find a variable, you localize it. So the working version of this script, which doesn't do any weird spooky action at a distance, is identical to that version, but this very first line inside the script is simply local, space, and then all the variable names we use, which is int or e, any okay, opt, opt in, opt arg, and val. Okay. Now, every time the function is called, it gets an entirely fresh int or e, an entirely fresh any okay, an entirely fresh opt, an entirely fresh opt in, an entirely fresh opt arg, an entirely fresh val. So I'm uh, struggling with, we have a lot of the same code being replicated throughout this as you're doing these buildup of examples. Where am I looking for mm -hmm. where you actually use the syntax of, of local? So in the final version of this file, which is pbs153f, Opt args. But I'm I'm in the show notes. At the, at the very first line of the function. Uh, in the function, in the show notes, it's ju I just copied the one line rather than copying the entire function again because I thought it would be too confusing. So it says localize the appropriate variables, local, int or e, any okay. Just, it's the two paragraphs above reusing functions with source. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm looking for localize the and it's not in here. Uh, spooky action at a distance. I scrolled up and down. I'm I'm lost. I'm lost. Uh, we're past it. Use local. Okay, there. Oh, woo, oh, got it. Okay. Oh, and I know you said this for the audience, but I was busy trying to find it. So local, and then you just list all the variables. Enter re. Any okay. Opt. Opt in. Opt arg and val. Okay. Yeah, just list them, and that's it. All the spooky action at a distance just evaporates because now we have a proper scope on our function. So do you start by localizing everything you're doing and then when you realize you need something global, then you change it or you remove it from Correct. the local list? Okay. Yeah. So when I start a function, I put the word local and I just leave it there. And then every time I go to use a variable, I scroll up, I type my variable name up there and then I use it. I pretend bash needs me to declare variables. It doesn't. But yeah. if you pretend it does, then you'll get it right. Ah, okay. So I just pretend that local is declaring my variables, which it sort of is. It's declaring them as local. So the final piece of the puzzle for today is I've been saying that the reason we want functions is to avoid code reuse, which is very true. But if you're working on a very specific script that does something really one-off, you're going to write a function that has no meaning anywhere ever again, right? It does this one weird thing and you need it in this one script and that's great. But that's not how coding often goes, right? You find yourself doing something quite generic that you would like to use in 20 scripts. Do you write a function in your first script, then say, oh, great, that one works, and then copy and paste it into the other 19 scripts, and then three weeks later you find that you've made a typo, and then you have to remember the other 19 scripts? No, you don't, of course, or you don't want to. So you can pull the content of one bash file into another script as if you had typed it there. Oh, really? Basically, okay. you import it as if you had just typed it there. And the command is source, followed by the file name to go get. 
Well, and handy. so you can give it the full path. You can give it a relative path and it will be relative to the current working directory, which is dangerous because if you have your script sitting in your home directory and you're off in some other directory, then your dot is not your home directory. And so a relative path would be dangerous. So you can use the trick of dear name dollar zero, which we used when we were doing our menu example. Which is probably what you want to do 99 percent of the time, because that will basically say include this file next to my script. Not next to where I am, next to where my script is. So oh, it gives you a relative path yeah. relative to your script. Yeah. Or the other way to do it is to have a single folder in your home directory where you put all of your utility scripts and then use the full path. Actually, you could use tilde. You could say source tilde slash. Sure. But having it relative Basically. path lets you know that you're where you are. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I, I tend to go with the relative path. The point is, Source followed by a file path will suck all of the code in as if you had typed it at that point in the file. So it's just import, basically. So if you have all of your functions sitting in a folder and you just give them sensible names, then you can just say source, you know, get check int or whatever, and then it'll pull in your check int function or whatever. And you just, you know, you build up a little library of useful things. I like it. Do you have a lot of these? I do have a few. <laughs> I do have a few, yes. And I keep them all in sync across my Macs using Shamewa. I didn't tell you uh, a couple of days ago, or I was just doing, uh, oh, I was working with you on making some changes to my Git config. And then I realized, oh man, I have to go over to my, now that I have two laptops, I had to go over to my other laptop and change it. I was, man, I wish there was some way to like version control this. <laughs> oh, he's going to spank me if I say that out loud. <laughs> Well, it's an easy answer. So if you picked yes, up you the series while we were uh, just on Bash, you might want to go back and take a look at uh, the Chez Moi series. Indeed, yes. Forget which will exactly get you right. into the Git rabbit hole, because <laughs> Chez Moi is very gitty, um, which is a good rabbit hole to be in. Exactly. So we have now arrived at a point where we really have covered... Not just the Bash basics. I had intended this to be a very superficial view of Bash, but you know something? We've actually covered more Bash than most sysadmins will ever use. Because <laughs> most sysadmins use other people's Bash and they don't quite know what it does. We now have truly covered all of the important features of Bash. And like I said, we're going to tie it all together in a neat little package in one final installment. But in terms of new stuff, in terms of ideas and concepts, we actually have a really good grasp of shell scripting now. And we have all the means we need to do this, uh, as the English expression goes, in anger, because we can use functions and the source command to break apart our reusable pieces and stick them in such a place that we really can build up a library of shell scripts to do powerful things for us. And, you know, you could then combine that with something like Text Expander to call your various little scripts and things. But, you, you know, we're building up really powerful stuff here and we've learned a lot of very powerful tools here. So I think the big takeaway from today is that we know how to make functions, we know how scope works, and finally I can stop saying never mess with ifs. <laughs> I can change my advice to be only mess with the localized copies of ifs. Because once you localize it, you're not doing spooky action at a distance anymore. You're doing very controlled action at a distance because you are deciding that you need the input server to be the comma for your purposes within this defined piece of your code base. That is that is powerful, not spooky. <laughs> that is good. So three months ago I when say, I tried to use ifs and you said no, now we know the answer why. Now we know why I was very, I, I didn't want to really go into too much detail of why it was dangerous, but I definitely said it could cause spooky action and this is that it might bite you. And I worked very hard in my examples to avoid it, which sometimes was a bit circuitous. Right, right. I was like, I know there's a right way to do this. It's the local keyword, but I can't say it yet. <laughs> now I can. So I always like when we get to this stage of a series because I can stop remembering what it is I'm lying by omission about. Because <laughs> I never tell you an untruth, right? I, I work right. really hard never to give an untruth. I just very judiciously don't mention things that would be confusing until we're ready. And I'm done. They're all gone. I don't have any more hidden little mustn't say, <laughs> mustn't say. And I love that because then I can just do stuff. Th easy. That's a lot of mental so load like, well, you've been carrying. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, it's always the case. And it's, like I say, I never want to lie, but I do want to not confuse, which is difficult. So 
We're going to wrap it up in a bow next time. If you would like a challenge, I'm afraid I wasn't very imaginative this time, but I can promise you that your code for printing out your multiplication table reuses some logic in a few places. It must have some bad smells of code reuse. Find them, replace them with functions. There we go. Easy enough. Well, this, I, I've got to give you a uh, tip of the hat. I know there have been a lot of times I've struggled with uh, trying to understand things. These show notes are amazing this week. These are, not that they aren't always, but the the clarity and the, the simplicity of your examples really helped. That they weren't, they weren't big complex things. They were small bite-sized pieces that I could go, okay, I know what checking to see if something is an integer. Okay, let's just do that little tiny thing. So I appreciate that. That was thank lovely. you. I know it takes extra work to to be sim- simpler than it does to be complex sometimes. I'm I'm just really happy we ha- we by accident had quite a few weeks to write these notes because they went through a few iterations. <laughs> okay, good. But I li- I'm really happy where they ended up. Actually, I, I was I went out for my cycle in a very good mood, and even though I got a puncture, I still came home in a good mood. <laughs> good, good. All right. Okay, well, until we convene for one more bit of bashing, happy computing. If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.